Greetings, traveller. Welcome to episode four of Soundwave, the science fiction with a dash of speculative fiction podcast from the legit award-winning magazine Shoreline of Infinity. I am your humble host, R.J. Bailey. But it's a little, it's a little Easter egg. It's an Easter egg. For, if you're into serial killers, you might know what that is. Beaming out the best in SF from Stella Conlata here in orbit, roughly geosynchronous with Midlothian, Scotland. Our mission is to spread the healing, thought-provoking and exciting power of sci-fi to all citizens of planet Earth and further afield. Now, if you think that sci-fi has the power to make people question the bigger things and consider aspects of life from a different angle, why not become a member of the Stella Conlata Guild and help us extend our reach? Just head over to patreon.com forward slash shoreline of infinity to be inducted into the guild at whatever rank you wish. Just look for the Soundwave specific Patreon levels. You'll also be helping to buy new equipment, which will be invested back into the show, starting with RX7, which is a tasty piece of software that will allow us to produce, us, me, to produce, <laughs> to produce higher quality content faster. Throughout season one, you'll be able to join our Patreon levels for a lower price than you will be in the future. So now really is the best time to join the mission early and make your contribution felt. But RJ, what are these sounds of sci-fi we'll be helping to spread? I hear you whinge. Well, while episode three did contain the rather magnificent, if I do say so myself, audio drama Republic of David, it was as such due to the uh, larger effort that that kind of production requires shorter than previous episodes. So to counter that, the STG and myself have put together a fatric bombatric of an episode. And yes, while quantity does have its own quality, this isn't just a desperate attempt to fill up airtime. A distinctive voice you'll have heard before in the pilot episode's audio drama, Other Colours, joins us in the form of Ben Blow, here to perform for the first time as a Voxtect with the story Apocalypse Beta Test Survey by Greg Chamberlain. Uh, for Americans, that's beta test. We'll also be hearing from his co-star from Other Colours, Jonathan Whiteside, reading Eric Brown's Target. It's not going to be a total banger carnival, however, as we're also hearing from Sue Guyford, who's going to narrate Tyler Petty's story, Death Do Us Part, from way back in winter 2015's Shoreline of Infinity, teeny tiny number two. But wait, there's more. I'll be chatting with Shoreline of Infinity's reviews editor Sam Dolan in this episode's Sonic Space about her role, her publications, and literary theory, and more. And the nuclear blast doors have been opened once again, and our music this show is courtesy of one of my actual favourite bands at the moment, the folk prog metal hurdy-gurdy featuring Cellar Darling. No, not a joke. Actual hurdy-gurdy playing. Chaboy has been able to uh, get access to Cellar Darling's audiobook as well that accompanies their new album, The Spell, and it's available on their special edition, narrated by the lead singer and player of said hurdy-gurdy, Anna Murphy. And so we'll be able to hear a sample chapter from that as well. But right now, a story. Apocalypse Beta Test Survey by Greg Chamberlain Narrated by Ben Blow Greetings, gentle being, or whatever current alternative non-gender specific address form is acceptable, and please excuse this interruption of your dream state, as we at Armageddon Inc., where our motto is, the horsemen are always ready to ride ask you to consider taking part in a new project. Inasmuch as our psychological profile indicates you may be someone with a potential interest and inclination to be part of a select subjects group to assist us in a beta test of our new designer Doomsday line of product services, 
which we are planning to introduce given the overwhelming popular appeal of the recent Mayan calendar crisis, although this time we can assure one and all that every possible glitch is worked out to avoid a repeat of that fiasco. And also we can now offer a wide choice of cataclysms that will fulfil any apocalyptic fantasy, featuring such perennial favourites as World War Three, with or without atomic orbital bombardment option, along with ecological catastrophe, nuclear winter, solar flares, or a full speeded up expansion of the sun. Plus we have a plethora of pandemic possibilities, and a new selection of current cutting-edge fads like robotic revolution, the biblical judgment day, or other theological visions of doom like Norse Ragnarok, complete with the Fimble Winter, or, for the more intellectually inclined, total global economic chaos. And of course, we do have traditional fan favourites like Alien Invasion, along with both a standard and a deluxe version of Zombie Apocalypse, and all of these have a 100% satisfaction guarantee with this no-risk trial offer, or Armageddon Inc. promises to restore your space-time continuum to its current steady-state setup, minus an acceptable minimum of collateral damage or change based on our certified accounting department's calculations. And so, before we return you to your Theta Rhythm REM session, please take a nano moment to consider and take quick advantage of this exclusive, one-time-only unique opportunity. Our operators are standing by ready for your virtual signature on the contract. So be the first in your demographic to end the world before someone else beats you to it. And please note, this offer may be void, prohibited and subject to certain restrictions on some planes of the multiverse. And with that cautionary note, we thank you for your time and attention. And if you would just submit yourself now to our customer survey satisfaction scan, totally painless, we assure you. And then we will once again thank you for your cooperation. Wishing you good luck and a nice life, however it might end. The delightfully bleak humour of Greg with 3G's Chamberlain in the form of Apocalypse Beta Test Survey and doesn't Ben Blow's sonorous tones bring an element of malign authority to it? The late great Sir Christopher Lee in his final years was not about to rest on his laurels simply because he was in his late 90s and created a two-part heavy metal concept album series based around the life and times of Charlemagne, King of the Franks, and Ben's voice reminds me very much of Lee's narration, and indeed singing throughout those albums. So, Please take it as a compliment, Ben, when I say you sound very much like a near-death Christopher Lee. Coincidentally, by the way, that I'm listening to it right now in my headphones, and there's a couple of legit bangers on there. Notably, Act 3, The Bloody Verdict of Verdun from Album 1, The Cross and the Sword, and Massacre of the Saxons from Album 2, The Omens of Death. It's really good, actually. It's very good good chorus. In fact, if you're listening to us on Spotify, why not head over there and listen to it after this show? And if you're not listening to us on Spotify, but you would like to listen to us on Spotify, we're on Spotify. So you don't have to download uh, download files, carrying them. You can just stream it all, should you so wish. No need to use that deeply restrictive, almost so- software fascist, fruit-based pod capturing platform. Any iTunes, talking about iTunes. Uh, Do you fancy uh, some more bleakly humorous science fiction that revolves around death? Of course you do. Who doesn't love it? Many would say bleakly humorous science fiction that revolves around death is the best kind of sci-fi. Would I? I honestly don't know. I haven't thought about it enough. Would you? What do you think? Tweet me at RJ Bailey, B-A-Y-L-E-Y, not the usual way. My My ancestors had to make things difficult for their descendants, didn't they? Is bleakly humorous sci-fi the best sci-fi? And if so, which is the best sci-fi of the bleakly humorous variety? My money personally is on Robocop, of which this next piece has one theme in common, but much less gore. Death 
Do Us Part by Tyler Petty Read by Sue Guyford It was Janine's turn to die. Her hiking boots skidded down the path's loose gravel, forcing her to scout an alternate route. Shielding her eyes against the sun, she estimated the distance between handholds on a steeper course. It would entail some scrambling, but she could make it. The exhilaration of the jump would be more than worth the effort, and resurrection would invigorate her in time for dinner. While his wife climbed, Lewis gathered the remnants of their picnic, moved the tiny twigs and grass statue she had weaved away from the danger zone, and spread out their new collection tarp. With the old one, missing the target zone had been a legitimate concern, but Janine would have to sprout short-lived wings to miss now. The commercial still trumpeted the helical dangers of missing limbs and genetic extrapolation, although they had never met anyone deformed by a botched resurrection. What had sold them was the all-terrain cart that came with the tarp. Lewis could heft her £130 corpse without much trouble, although toting it all the way back to the car would have been tedious. But for Janine to carry his £200-plus pounds of military bulk tomorrow, when it would be his turn to die, was another story. Ready? she shouted from the summit. Lewis waved the all clear towards her silhouette. Janine's outline disappeared as she backed up for a running start, before she reappeared in a spread eagle dive. Her skin eclipsed the sunlight, transmuting her into a sports bra, shorts, and boots held together by spectral attraction. When he was the one in the air, the seconds of freefall stretched and collapsed, an hour and an instant at the same time. From the ground, though, Terminal acceleration was impossible to gauge. As soon as her feet left the cliff behind, she had already impacted, crashing into the tarp with a force too hurried to be truly impressive. The blend of canvas and vinyl crinkled underfoot as he inspected her body. She had died on impact, fortunately. Last year she had survived a wretched landing, limbs mangled, punctured organs leaking, yet somehow clinging to consciousness, forcing him to usher her oblivion. He prayed he would never see such abject agony again. Lewis surveyed the scene for any stray bits of his wife, but her body had remained within the impact zone. He folded the tarp over her and sealed the edges, then rolled the cart over and set up its vacuum sealer attachment. Removing the air made her less cumbersome. The nearest resurrection centre was down the road from their hotel. After the Wilton Foundation announced their epochal technology, the centres had sprung up seemingly overnight, as if the announcement were not a serendipitous leap forward, but the latter stages of a meticulous reshaping of the world's economy. When they drove to the cliff that morning, they had passed a diner boasting the best chilli in the world. On his way back, Lewis pulled in and strolled up to the counter, leaving Janine's corpse in the trunk. What'll it be? asked the waitress, a middle-aged redhead whose smile said she worked here by choice, not out of necessity. That chilli sign caught my eye while I was driving past. I consider myself something of an expert, Lewis replied. I'm pretty thirsty too. What kinds of beer do you have? Just the one. She nodded at the logo behind her. Will that work for you? He nodded in return. Be back in a minute, hun. The diner had a carefully curated atmosphere. Steps above a dive, but too coarse for a franchise. Photographs of the area's countryside and wildlife populated the walls with truckers' hats advertising companies Lewis had never heard of. The waitress set a steaming bowl of chilli in front of him, then grabbed a beer from the cooler. She uncapped it against the edge of the counter, 
and slid it beside the bowl. Let me know if you'd like anything else, she said, leaving to attend to a family that had slid into a booth. The husband and wife sat together on one side, their son by himself on the other. The boy's legs reached halfway to the floor. The white chill is even better. Lewis swivelled towards the voice, his knee rebounding off the speaker's hip, and he drifted back to face his bowl. Whoa, didn't mean to freak you out. You all right? The voice belonged to a tall woman with wavy brown hair and turquoise eyes. She wore a loose sundress and sandals, with leather straps that bisected her ankles and lower calves. What? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm Mills, by the way. It's short for Mildred, she added, which is an old lady name, so once I wasn't an old lady anymore, I had to shorten it. Millie is old lady too. Yeah, lots of people roll back their age. I was one of the first volunteers. My husband died a few months before the machines, and once Wilton decided people like him wouldn't be coming back, I didn't know what to do with myself. You must have been desperate, if Wilton guinea pig sounded like a good option. She smirked. Our kids were already grown. Wilton and I both knew no one would miss me if it went sideways. And I had my husband waiting for me if it did. Now I'm a photographer. She looked at the pictures on the wall. Not just for this place, of course, but these are some of my favourites. The light around here is terrific. What about you? Lewis swallowed a mouthful of chilli and took a pull from his beer before answering. I'm just on vacation. Leave, technically. I'm a peacekeeper for Wilton. I'll start my new deployment in a few weeks. Can't say where. Half of what Wilton does is classified. In fact, I might have to take you in just for saying that. You know too much now. Mills gave him a conspiratorial pat on the wrist. I had to sign a Wilton NDA of my own. I know how scary their lawyers can be. So, how long are you in town? A few more days. At the glint in Mills' eyes, the tenor of their conversation finally dawned on him. He spooned chilli to buy time. But... I'm gonna be pretty busy. I have dinner plans tonight. Well, if your schedule opens up, feel free to give me a call. She slid a business card out of her bag and into his shorts pocket. I'll be shooting the rocks for the next day or two. It gets lonely out there. While the waitress took Mills's order, Lewis shoveled the rest of his chilli. He thought better of chugging the beer and hurried out to the car chuckling at the story he would tell Janine after she was resurrected. Sunlight streamed through the window, dazzling Janine when she opened her eyes. She groped across the resurrection room for her clothes, finally finding them on the table in the corner, where they always were. It took a minute for her memory to catch up to her body. While she dressed, Janine glanced at the clock above the machine that had just reconstituted and vivified her. The clock was fast. It had to be. She should have come back half an hour ago. Her spongy flip-flops exhaled against her feet. In the hall, Janine found a resurrection tech and told him about the clock. He returned a moment later looking concerned. Are you feeling all right, Mum? he asked. Time distortion is an occasional side effect of the process. I know the side effects. This isn't my first resurrection, she replied, more brusque than she had intended. It's just... that clock's off, right? No, it's right on time, but like I said, some people experience missing time. He checked her delivery record on a screen by the door. You were brought in complete, so we didn't have to synthesise anything. I could still run a diagnostic, just in case. I don't need a diagnostic. She
she sidestepped the tech and stumbled out to the lobby where Lewis was folding their industrially dry-cleaned tarp. Let me see your watch, or phone, whatever, something with a time on it. Lewis pulled his phone out of his pocket, and Mills's business card fluttered to the floor. Janine scrutinised the screen while he retrieved the card. Your phone is wrong too, she said. What the hell is going on? All the clocks are fast. Lewis pocketed the card. Let's go back to the hotel. I'll explain about the time on the way. He finished the story while they were walking past the concierge desk, but she waited until they were in the elevator to respond. What the fuck, Lewis? She yelled at the control panel, unable to face him. What? You heard me, right? Nothing happened. I left as soon as I figured out she was hitting on me. Do you really think that's the issue? She asked, steadying herself on the arm rail. Then what is it? Sorry, but I don't get why you're so mad. All right, let's review. She turned, her grey eyes staring through him. She absently rubbed her shoulder, sliding the strap of her tank top along her shoulder blade. I died, and your first thought was, Hey, chili sounds good. Did I miss anything? Lewis shook his head. That's not what it was like. I mean, we both saw the sign this morning. And at any point, while my corpse was in the trunk, remember, did you think about, I don't know, waiting until I was alive again and going back with me so we could try the best chilli in the goddamn world together? The elevator stopped at their floor. Lewis followed Janine out. Okay. I get it now. I didn't think about it like that. I wasn't thinking at all, to be honest. It just happened. I mean, you were dead. What's the big deal? She stopped in front of their room. After a passing maid was out of earshot, Janine asked, Were we still married? You in the diner with sexy picture girl, me wrapped up in the trunk. Was I still your wife? She felt her pockets for a wallet or the room key, forgetting she had entrusted her possessions to him before the jump. Open the damn door. First of all, I never called her sexy. I said she was pretty, but that's different. He followed her into the room. And yes, of course we were still married. As soon as I left the diner, my first thought was how I'd tell you about it. Although, I imagined it would go better than this. What about deployments? Are we still married then? Do I really need to answer that? And did telling this photographer about my art even occur to you? You know, the sculptures your wife creates while you're on the other side of the world? Janine flopped onto the chair by the window. That's what I thought. I need to not look at you for a while. Okay, if I take a shower? Fine. He peeled off his dusty t-shirt and shorts, tossed them on the bed and went into the bathroom. The shower started a minute later. He left his dirty clothes where they were going to sleep, assuming they could stand to spend the night in the same room. Janine slipped off her flip-flops and kicked Lewis's clothes to the floor, sending a small paper rectangle fluttering after them. That grandmother fucker, she said scanning Mills's business card. Janine ransacked the suitcase for her hair straightener. Its serpentine cord trailed as she carried it into the bathroom. Before her husband could react to the intrusion, she plugged it in and tossed it under the shower curtain. She teased her hair in the mirror while he sputtered. After unplugging the cord and waiting for any residual charge to dissipate, she turned off the water and went back to the main room. She stretched her legs on the bed and turned on the TV. It was the middle of the afternoon, so nothing good was on. She flipped between an ambush talk show and a volleyball match. 
At the top of the hour, she dialed the front desk from the nightstand phone, choked up some tears and said, uh, th there was an accident. Yeah, in my room, my husband was taking a shower and uh, I was doing my hair, but I slipped. The straightener, it, yeah. Yes, yes, I do. He's a big guy. The eastern sun glanced off the windshield. Janine, wearing running tights and a zip-up fleece, tried to hip-check her tracksuited husband away from the driver's door. He caught her when she rebounded off him. Might as well give me your keys now, she said. Ah, oh, right. With an exaggerated twitch, he fished them out of his pocket, adding his wallet and a granola bar he had swiped from the continental breakfast to her supplicant hands. It's my turn. What a delightfully bitter taste that leaves in the mouth. If you were wondering what the theme it shares with Robocop is, that would be internal thigh-mounted high-caliber machine pistols capable of blowing off genitals. Just kidding, it's resurrection. Next up, a change in item type as we present you this episode's Sonic Space, in which I have a very cosy chat with the Shoreline of Infinity reviews editor Sam Dolan. Now, I do erroneously name her as the books editor for Shoreline of Infinity at the start, but in my defense, as you'll hear in the audio, I was tired and my mind hadn't quite properly warmed up yet. It's the cerebral equivalent of switching on a beige but yellowing 90s PC, where you can go and make a coffee to the delightful soundtrack of the hard drive literally whirring and grinding into life, safe in the knowledge you'll already be on your second cup before the Windows loading screen has even begun. For my sleep-addled and already very simple mind, the thought process was, Sam Dolan, books, editor, books editor, and that's it. Plus, you didn't correct me. Like, so what can I say? What can I do? I ask you. If you're a, a like a literary criticism nerd or art criticism nerd, which, uh, which th they are out there. I used to be one, not anymore. Uh, I am a bit, like, I lean into it, I enjoy it, but I just don't read a lot of criticism anymore. Apart from uh, Shoreline of Infinity, which you can pick up direct from the website, shorelineofinfinity.com. Uh, if you are a nerd of that kind, this, there is an unabridged version of this interview on Patreon for Receptor Interralists. Just look for the relevant uh, Patreon level. The unabridged version has uh, a deeper dive into literary theory, and we discuss the death of the author, genre, more about literary fiction, racist language and older fiction, authorial construction and responsibility, and it's pretty much twice as long. But in the meantime, this will do very nicely. Please get cozy and enjoy this chat with the incredibly charming Sam Dolan. Hello, you're listening to Sonic Space here on Soundwave, Shoreline of Infinity's sci-fi podcast. I am here with uh, the book editor of <laughs> Shoreline of Infinity, uh, Sam Dolan, I, who I am a big fan of the name of because as soon as Noel, the editor-in-chief, told me there was someone working for Shoreline called Sam Dolan, I immediately assumed it was a 1940s gumshoe private eye with a name like that. Yeah. How you do it? It's, it's a good name, isn't it? It is, and you're not alone. It happens all the time. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, less of the 1940s and more just of a, oh, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how are you doing this, this fine morning? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I am a little bit tired, as we've just discussed off mic, but I've got a massive novelty cup of uh, coffee and I've also got diet cola so I'm good to go I've got all the caffeine in the world oh, are. Uh, are you a caffeine drinker um tea and hot chocolate are, are my vices that's tea and hot it. chocolate yeah that that's tasty it's a tasty combination uh, never <laughs> never tried it mixed together. 
Not together. I was going to say I've never tried it mixed up, but you know, yeah. uh, each to their own. So, tell me, Sam, uh, what what on earth does a book editor do for Shoreline? Um, we run the table really. So, uh, during a review cycle, we'll get either heads up on books that are coming out in the next couple of months or weeks or whatever, and then uh, we provide that list to our excellent bank of reviewers who pick whichever one seems the most interesting to them we send it out they read it and within about six weeks we get between 800 and a thousand words of piercing insights oh wow when you said we run the table mm -hmm. is that kind of like a publishing term or is that like a you know slang I feel like, like we... it's a gambling term. I oh, really? <laughs> I think I've heard it in a film. I spent a lot of time at the University of Hollywood, so a lot of my isms come from there. So, <laughs> um, so how did you get involved with, with Shoreline of Infinity? Uh, well, I was um, on the MA Napier course, so doing creative writing, and a lot of my colleagues in the cohort were involved in it, um, but I have a lot of my own extracurriculars, so I didn't get involved right at the beginning. But last, was it last year or the year before? Might have been the year before. We had um, a call for reviewers to read books written by, well, sci-fi books written by women for the International Women's Day um, <clears throat> issue. So mm -hmm. I took the... Uh, M.K. Jameson's the fifth season and reviewed it and sort of just stayed on after that. Um, the book, the reviews editor at the time was stepping down to do other projects. And I was like, well, if, if there's a space, I'll take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, why, why did they keep you on out of the other people who submitted reviews? Um, <laughs> I think because I asked <laughs> Um, but no, so when we, we all got a blast email saying that he was stepping down and I was just, I just thought, oh, I'll throw my hat in the ring and I'll see what happens. Cause if you don't ask, you don't get. And I think a few other people did and Noel went round and spoke to everyone. And I, I just, I, I guess I was a good fit. I don't know. I don't know how the other interviews went, but I sort of, I really wanted it. I, I, I can't even really explain why it's just. There aren't many opportunities that sort of, that present themselves like this. And I've always wanted to be in this sphere, in the writing and publishing and reading and reviewing sphere, just creatively. Um, and getting there by yourself is nigh on impossible. So mm -hmm. you need a network and you need to work with people. And when opportunities arise, even though I'd never done it before and had no idea if I could do it. <laughs> I thought <laughs> you don't get to where you want to be by not taking opportunities. So I jumped at it um, and I was lucky enough to get it. No, you're absolutely right. And, and the whole thing about you, you don't get to where you want to be by not taking opportunities, even though you've not done it before. Like, you know, you will never achieve anything if you only stick to things which you have done before because that is actually a very small amount of things to begin with exactly so you were on the um creative writing course did you say yep uh what what took you down that path uh do, do you did you do you still have ambitions to creatively write i mean obviously as a book editor there's creativity involved in there but i assume the creative writing course was like what most people think of writing stories right yes it was um and there was a lot of theory involved in it as well so you know the the idea of the construction of the author and all of these kind of really interesting ideas of how we create stories um but i went down that path because um well i'd just moved to edinburgh i moved up here from london in 2013 and hadn't settled in very well if i'm honest it was it was weird. All of my family was still down south. I didn't have any of my friends here. I just felt really out of place. Um, we rented a house for a while that had massive spiders in it. So I was just <laughs> unhappy on every level. Um, 
And so I started to think about things that made me happy that I would want to do that could could help me build a life for myself outside of just being wife and mother. Mm-hmm. And I saw the MA creative writing at Napier and you had to, you get given a prompt and you write a short story and then they come in for an interview. Um, and I thought, why not? <laughs> Let's give yeah. that a go and see what happens. That seems to be a, the way I live a lot of my life is, uh, yeah, let's roll those dice and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so um, w- w- with with the creative writing course, I'm quite interested, actually, um, not in doing it myself. I'm just interested <laughs> in, in what it was. Um, uh, when you, you know, was, did it allow for sci-fi? Was it, a, did you write sci-fi on that course or was it more strict, strictly literary fiction? <laughs> Okay, first of all, scrub the disdain, because literary fiction <laughs> is important. But um, no, so it was, it. there was a genre course. I did it part-time, so I got that in my second year. Um, mm-hmm. And that was what introduced me to sci-fi. I had been, I'd been a YA writer <clears throat> before that, writing predominantly fantasy. Uh, but the course encourages you to write in the first person and in the third person, um, using different devices um, and different themes. So you don't just write the same stories over and over again. And when I got to the genre course, um, I realized that I'm not very good at writing horror. It's not really where I live. But what I liked about sci-fi was that it gave me more, it gave me more control than fantasy did. Because every time I hit a roadblock in a fantasy, there'd be, a, and this is just me, by the way, other fantasy writers don't do this, but I, there was always an ex machina that I could use that would get me out of that situation. And I, you know, the first time I put a story idea to the, um, to the tutors at Napier, it was thoroughly panned because mm. I had been doing that every time I hit a roadblock, there was a ta-da moment. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize how much of my writing depended on those kinds of cheap tricks, to be honest. Um, and when I started writing sci-fi, you don't, you, if you want to do it properly, you don't get that because you can't just have a machine that does it for you. If you want to write sci-fi, the machine has to have grown from something. There has to have been an evolution and it mm-hmm. has to have its limitations of whatever time period that you're in. Um, and you can make it fantastical, but it's still contained within what's plausible. And I think that's my favorite thing about it. Do you prefer sci-fi now then to, yes. to fantasy? Yeah, I do. I really do. I'm still quite new at it. Um, but I, I love reading fantasy. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for that. Queen of the Queen of the Tearling trilogy was just like, it was life for me for so mm-hmm. long. Um, but yeah, when I'm writing, I feel like there's more, there's, I've got more creativity there than I did in fantasy, probably because it's new to me, because it's, it's still a voyage of discovery. Sure, and, sure. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Um, nice crowbarring into Star Trek references there as well, deliberately <laughs> or not. <laughs> uh to do two different series um so y- you noticed my kind of mocking um you, it's pronunciation of the word literary um yeah because you were that, s- subtle yeah that come that's probably comes from a place of ignorance and misunderstanding if mm. i'm honest which is a failing upon me what what is literary fiction i, I don't even know if i could really define it because to me, it's like drama. It, it is. So for me, if you're going with literary fiction, it's more drama's probably fair, but it's like anything that isn't a specific genre. It's, it's kind of like everything else to me. So it's stories about real people in real situations and more like a soap opera, but I don't mean to be disparaging with that. It's mm-hmm. less about magics or um, spaceships or monsters under your bed. It's more about really how you deal with and work through life. And I think there's definitely a place for that. I mean, when you do it in a genre, 
you can use allegory and things that make it less on the nose. But if you don't, if you don't like reading sci-fi, you don't like reading fantasy, I think people need to be able to see their lives reflected in the literature that they read. If you get used to reading something, if you read one particular type, you'll close yourself off to other opportunities. Mm -hmm. So with something like Star Wars, I allow that to be, yeah, it's sci-fi and it's fantasy, but it's, it's an adventure more than anything. So I don't pin it down to anything. Like if you like adventure, you will probably like this film. But if you don't like sci-fi and you get told it's a sci-fi film, you'll go in there thinking, well, this isn't really my thing. I understand that. I, I do see where you're coming from. For me, though, I would if I if I wasn't told it was a sci fi and I don't like sci fi films and I went in. I would feel tricked. <laughs> I'd be like, well, you, you could have told me it had spaceships in it, mate. Yeah, but why? So that you could like it, you could not like it before you even get there? So no, you can choose how nice. to spend your time. No, you're going to the cinema. Just open your mind and <laughs> let yourself be carried away. No, you're right. You're very right. You're very right. I am, I am a, a I am ve I'm a, I'm a very close-minded, unpleasant person. Is, is what this boils down to. <laughs> oh, if that's what I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, so, I, I I want to know. Interesting. Um, I I've reviewed things for publications in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you started with Shoreline by submitting a, 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 and uh, and getting published a review. Um, what makes a good re book reviewer? How do you re how do you review a book? Okay, so there are different schools of thought. <clears throat> and what we do at Shoreline is more, um, it's more supportive because we're all creatives and we know what it is to have our work destroyed. That is not to say that we like everything that we read, <clears throat> but our reviews are constructive. So the first thing we have to do is obviously read it, take our time, get through it, and then get the overall impression and when you're reviewing it, you'll want to take a couple of examples of what in the book worked for you, what didn't, um, and then finish it up with your overall sort of examples of your overall impression of it. Um, now, when I'm when I'm writing a review, I lead with the things that I liked, especially if the overall tone didn't sit with me. You know, I don't I don't like to cause I know how I would feel if somebody had read something of mine and was just like, yeah, no, that was rubbish. What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> that would crush <laughs> me. Um, but sometimes if what they were intending. So I reviewed um, an anthology a couple of review, a couple of editions ago, and mm -hmm. each of the separate stories were really good and stood on their own. And at the end of every single one, there was an explanation from the author about what the story meant. Sure. And I was like, that, that is what ruined it for me. That was yeah. a, that was a break. Cause there were so many times that the story sort of came alive in my head and then reading those author's notes, shut them down again. So I uh, yeah. stopped reading those. I just skipped to the next story. And yeah, that's the kind. So when I mentioned it in my review, that was, I didn't say it like, Oh no, that ruined the whole story. It was more, the author should have the confidence that their stories can stand by themselves without having to feel the need to justify them because they were beautiful stories and they absolutely mm. stood by themselves. Kind of sounds like they're treating you, possibly treating you like an idiot as well. Oh, no. No? no? no like, no, just no. so you understand, <laughs> I would now take the time to explain this for you. I think it, I think it comes from a lack of confidence. Because to, to make sure that what you think you're saying is what they understand that you've said, you put in a, a little thing afterwards. But sure. she really didn't need to do that. Really yeah. didn't. And I, I hope that when you read reviews like that, that give you the confidence in what you've put forth, it mm -hmm. means that your next iteration, maybe you don't do that. Or maybe you just do like a big in in the thank yous at the end you have a a quick talk about your entire process but 
Mm-hmm. No, we, we've had some people submit to be reviewers to Shoreline who are hatchet artists, really, whose point of reading the book was to tear it apart. Um, and we have not moved forward with them as reviewers because it doesn't, I don't think a review like that helps anybody. Sure. And it's just not good. Does it sat like if it's just one, one constant tone, it doesn't sound like particularly good reading in its own right either. Yeah. It's just not cricket, really. I don't yeah. like it. So we what's the, um, what's the, uh, what's the onus or, um, you know, do you feel a need to be entertaining with the writing of it as well to make it into it, a, a, a work of art? It, it, to put it in Ponzi terms in its own right? <laughs> um, I think all of all of our reviewers, we have distinctive registers. You know, we, we have a way that we convey things. Um, as you may or may not have noticed, I'm somewhat verbose. Therefore, my, <laughs> my reviews tend to be a little wordy. Um, and I edit myself back down. Um, we have some reviewers that read a lot of their things in context to other things. So we get a lot of cultural popular references in them. Um, We have a lot of parentheses, a lot of asides. I like them to sound like somebody's talking to you rather than a book review. Sure. It's so it's more of a conversation and that gives the reviewers the space to really write how they engaged with it because otherwise every review would be the same yeah and we would just have so there isn't a formula for writing a book review you'll go online and you'll find things but but if you follow that with every book you read you will write the same review a hundred times um so all of our reviews or what i've been trying to do um is make them more like a conversation between us and the readers so that they have a basis on which they can trust our opinion yeah that makes a lot of sense i'm yeah i mean obviously i read it myself but i pretend i don't Uh, it's good to hear it's good to hear that uh because that's the kind of reviews i would like to uh read as well something which is more conversational academic stuff can sometimes send you to sleep a little bit yeah. Uh, you know, it has a purpose, obviously, and a place, and it's very important. But if you're sitting in a coffee shop uh, with your latest issue of Shoreline of Infinity, you don't necessarily want to go into the academic world. You want to be, you want to be delighted by the words you're reading, even if they are about other words that that person has read. Yeah. So, um, what what about your own publications? Um, I haven't done as many as I'd like. I do have an anthology on Amazon at the moment. Um, and it's called From the Other Side. Uh, it's been there for, ooh, about nine months now, doing mm-hmm. slow but steady business. Um, and it's a collection of short stories for, from myself, my friends who are also on the MA course with me, just to give people who are going through sort of emotionally draining times a little bit of an escape. Sure. Like, how did it come about? Well, I was... City, oh God. So back in 2016, I um, went into labour prematurely and ended up staying in the neonatal unit for uh, five weeks before my youngest passed away. And then another four weeks while her um, twin sister was getting strong enough and big enough to leave the hospital. And mm-hmm. I ended up just in waiting rooms and her breast pump rooms with bright stark lights just lost and confused and you you know you can talk to the other parents that are there if they're willing to but everyone is just going through one of the hardest times of their lives and Mm. there was no there was no end to it and that's the thing that you you sort you know what the path should be but when you have because my girls were born at 27 weeks so in theory, you don't get to go home until they reach their gestation period. That was 12 weeks away for me. Mm. So I had no idea how long I'd be there, what would happen, if they'd be okay, if I'd be okay. So 
I when I was like a year removed from it and I was starting to get my head back together I just thought I want to do something that could have been useful to me then to sort of to give back to all the people who really held me up during that time um and I I, I can't do much <laughs> I'm not I, I'm not uh I, I don't really like walking I can't climb things <laughs> I'm not <laughs> particularly physical, but I do write. So I figured if I could raise some money for, because we ended up in two different hospitals, if I could raise some money to help support the people who supported us, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I didn't want to do it by myself because <laughs> I didn't have the the time to write a full thing. So sure. I asked my friends for help and they rallied, which was just yeah, I know some really beautiful people. So if they're listening, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a trippy collection of just different types of stories. And there is some sci-fi in there and there's some literary fiction in there. <laughs> and, um... Ooh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but I'm joking. it's just, when you're reading it, um, my mum read it and she was like, I have no idea what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's kind of the point because... You're just, if you're in a situation, it's not just for people who have been in a neonatal unit, but they'll probably know what I mean. There's, there's no respite and you're not okay. You know, you're just, you're just not okay. And the times that you might feel like you're about to be okay, something will happen or you'll start to feel guilty because you're not, you know, it's just so much all the time. So the point mm. of these stories was one, to keep them short so that you could read one while you're pumping and not get lost and not have to, you know, figure out where you were. Mm -hmm. And two, just to give you five, 10, 15 minutes in which your brain can just relax for just, just breathe because it's so much harder to cope when you're tired and it's not the kind of tired that gets better when you go to sleep. Mm. So it's supposed to just give you a little bit of a respite so that you can carry on coping because that's basically all we can do. That's really great. Uh, I, I like the idea as well that what, you know, the, 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 the function dictating the form, that's, that sounds like it must have um, been, you know, pushed, pushed levels of invention within the author, authors. Authors. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I probably could have helped more. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't really give, like, the idea was like regeneration. So the mm -hmm. only parameters that we had was please don't be depressing because we've got enough of that. Yeah. Um, that's not the same as not being sad, but it's just, you know, we didn't want anything to be dark and painful and difficult to deal with because that's reality we don't need any more. Uh, mm. But beyond that, I really was up for anything, um, and we we got everything. That's fantastic. Did did you put any no nos on there apart from uh, depress depressive stuff? Like I I can't see horror going down very well in that anthology. Um, there, there's a there's one horror. Story. I don't know if I call it horror. It's um uh, it reads quite normally until. The end. It's by my friend uh, James Ebersole, and it was. I'm not going to spoil it because you should you should sure. <laughs> read it. But when I was doing the first proofread of it, I just I sent him a Facebook message going, "But but why though?" <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I, "Why not?" I was like, "Fair enough. <laughs> that is fair <laughs> enough." So in it went, and it was. I get a lot of questions about it. Nice. You know, my mum's uh, more practical, but yeah, it was. It was interesting. Wow. So a really a, a huge amount uh, of range and scope in there. So definitely, if you're uh, interested in, in this book and you don't have any preferences, you know, if you want to broaden your horizons, this sounds like a really good thing for our listeners to just get onto Amazon, uh, go and look for From the Other Side Anthology. You'll find it by Samantha Dolan, author and or the the illustrator Olive Black, you might also find it under their name as well. Yeah, uh, it's definitely something to pick up. Paperback is uh, only only nine ninety nine as well. Indeed, and on the Kindle, so you can have it on the go if you like. And there's Kindle Unlimited. 
for no pounds on there we, apparently we still get a donation though from from amazon so feel free good um, i was about to ask should we not promote that bit <laughs> <laughs> No, it's fine. We still, I think we get less, but we still get something. And mm -hmm. all the monies raised are going to the Victoria Hospital in Kokodi in Fife. And the, um, oh, I've forgotten its name. <laughs> Fourth Valley Royal in Larbert. Lovely, lovely. Well, um, that sounds like a very good time, uh, to, a piece to end on, Sam. So, so thank you ever so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. This is fun. Um, and uh, is there any, any words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to give aspiring book uh, reviewers, writers, or book editors? I don't know if I'm qualified to. You're but... a book editor of an <laughs> award-winning science fiction magazine. If you're not, who isn't? <laughs> oh, God. I would say just write it. Don't ask people what you what they want it to be about, what they are looking for. Just write what it is that you felt about the book that you've read and and send it out there because the chances are people agree with you. The chances are you have come to a conclusion that no one else has and you inspire somebody else to read it just because of that. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to inspire people to read. So get it written, send it over. Um, and it will, you know, share it with the world. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much, Sam. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And if you want to hear the full Patrick Bumbatrick version of that interview, it's an hour long. Uh, so it, you may have heard half of it, but there is a lot more to hear should you wish to uh, go over to Patreon and subscribe at the season one price of five buckaroos to listen uh, to the unabridged interviews, of which there will be... how What episode are we in? Six more to come. And uh, there's already been three before this as well. Since Sam is uh, obviously a beacon of uh, light and happiness, I thought it'd be best to kind of like bring things back down to earth with a crunch, with something uh, just like grim and relentlessly pessimistic. Target by Eric Brown. I was watching the 3D with Kelly when the program was interrupted. Uh oh, she said. I gripped her hand. Don't worry. She turned and stared at me, the hologram pulsing on her forehead. I stared at the 3D in the corner. The frame was empty, and a tall man in a black suit appeared. Kelly began to weep. The suit said, Citizens, your son, Edward, has been selected by LAPD for immediate targeting. Please make an appointment at your closest LAPD clinic within the next five days. I will now return you to sunny days in Idaho. Kelly jumped up and crossed to the bedroom door. I joined her, staring in at our sleeping son. He was curled up, warm and dreaming, innocent. Was I a fool, Joe, for thinking... I scratched my forehead where the hologram was. We both hoped, Kelly. We dreamed. I wonder at the chances of the child of two targets being selected. A statistical anomaly, I told myself. We killed the 3D and went to bed. I couldn't sleep. At two, with Kelly sound asleep beside me, I rolled out of bed, dressed quietly, and left the apartment. It was a risk. Venturing out after dark was always a gamble for people like me and Kelly. And for Edward now. But I needed a drink. More. I needed to talk. I kept to the shadows, skulking like a rat. I knew where the night cops usually patrolled, but you could never be sure. Sometimes they like to ring the changes to keep people like me on their toes. The bar wasn't signed. It was underground, literally. I crept down the steps, entered the code on the door, and slipped inside. It was like coming home. A dozen people like Kelly and me, holograms glowing in the semi-darkness, sat quietly drinking. 
I ordered a beer and drank. Thirty minutes later, I ordered another. I felt a little better then. At three, Al came in, fresh off his night shift. Hey, my friend, he clapped me on the shoulder. What you doing here? I told him about Ed's selection. He pulled a face. Hey, that's tough. I'm sorry. How's Kelly? I shrugged. Cut up. What do you expect? That's life, Joe. We gotta learn to live with it. Yeah, I said, and bought a couple of drinks. Shit. A few beers later, I staggered home. I kept to the shadows, but I wasn't afraid now. Dutch courage. Let the cops shoot me. Only tomorrow, when I'd sobered up, would I regret my foolishness. Regret potentially making Kelly a widow at 23. So we took Ed to the LAPD clinic, and a blank-faced nurse zapped her son with the laser and a neat, round hologram target implanted itself in the centre of his forehead. Our life changed after that. No more risks. With Ed's welfare to think of, we imposed a curfew on ourselves. Never go out after sunset, only during the day. Keep to busy areas. Avoid patrol cars and don't ever go anywhere near police stations. We got by. Ed was bullied at school, of course. I remember the time I'd been singled out for the hologram on my forehead. And I felt powerless to help him. Words were useless. He had to learn to look after himself, just as Kelly and I and all the others had done. He grew into a great kid. One day, he was around seven, eight, he came in after school and said, Dad, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. I could have wept. That's great, Ed. I glanced into the kitchen to see if Kelly had heard. She was facing the sink, her back tensed. He'll forget the ambition in time, I told myself. Move on to something else. That night, in bed, Kelly said, You're going to tell him he can't be a teacher. Years passed. We survived. I got a little heavier. My job at the landfill was steady. Kelly moved from Walmart to Safeway. We began to think about what Ed might do when he left school at 15. I had a word with my boss trying to get him a place at the landfill. Kelly's boss said there might be an opening stacking shelves in a few years. One night, I was late back from the landfill. Just 20 minutes, but it nearly cost me my life. I was turning the corner to my block when I heard an engine behind me. The car was crawling along. My belly flipped. I didn't turn, just walked faster. The car drew alongside. A cop car. Oh, Christ. The driver said, Stop right there and turn around real slow. I did that. The fat cop grinned. Hey, look what we got ourselves here, Gene. If it ain't a fucking target. His partner leaned forward, took a long look at me. The driver said, ID. I passed him my card. He scanned it, passed it back. I could see him calculating. Shoot me now, through the head, or have a little fun. Let me run and get me in the back. You work at MacReady's Landfill? That's right, sir, he said to his buddy. We ain't stiffed no one from the fill in years, have we? Don't think we have at that, Gene said. He passed me my ID. Off you go, boy. I turned, shaking, and began walking. I thought of Kelly making dinner at home. I thought of Ed and the girl he'd been seeing lately. I tensed myself for the bullet. Just make it quick, I thought, in the head. The cop car started up, caught up with me and drove alongside. The driver laughed. You're a lucky day, boy. You thank your fucking God I ain't in the mood. They drove off, laughing. And it was all I could do to stop myself yelling obscenities after the bastards. Ed was 13 when he came home one day and said, Dad, it's unfair. I shrugged. Life is unfair, Ed. But why? The country's overpopulated, Ed. The cops need to meet their quota. I suppose I meant 
Why me? Why us? I didn't like the whine in his voice. I shrugged again. Why not? Life's a lottery. You take the good with the bad. It's no good complaining. But there's nothing you can do, I said. End of. Learn to live with it. Do you hear your mom complain? Me? I just wish. I sighed. Try not to wish, Ed, I said. Just accept. Life wasn't that bad. We had the apartment. It was warm in the winter, cool in the summer. I had the job, my friends down the bar. Every month I took Ed to the game. I felt safe in the crowd. I had Kelly, a woman who loved me, and a son who was growing into a big, kind, bright young man. I watched the news, but didn't take much notice. There was nothing I could do to make anything better. The way I looked at it, the world had always been going to hell in a handcart. So why worry? Just accept. Ed left school and got a job at Safeway. He walked in every morning with Kelly and came back with her at six. The extra income bought us a few luxuries, takeaways at the Thai place that had just opened along the block, and a subscription to one of the big cable channels. I was 50, and I'd never been happier in my life. One day, Kelly and Ed were late back from work. I tried not to worry, but they were never late. I called Kelly's cell phone. No reply. The same with Ed's. 6.30 came and went, then 7. I tried calling them again. I turned on the 3D, tried to watch a documentary about the Arctic. Jesus, it's 8 o'clock. They'll be fine, I told myself. Kelly's just got herself some overtime, that's all, and Ed's helping her. And they're so damn busy they haven't had time to call. Then the image of the Arctic faded. I stared at the guy in the black suit, my heart racing. He stared back at me. I told myself he was just a virtual construct, not a real person, with feelings. But that didn't stop me hating the bastard. I regret to inform you, I interrupted. Who? I said. Kelly or Ed? Now, as a fellow uh, vo voice actor myself, I sound a cringe when I say that because I mean, it's literally my job. It's my day job, mostly narrating audiobooks, but I still cringe saying voice actor. Um, may may maybe, maybe I should try not saying it in that voice. Maybe that would alleviate the problem, RJ. Good grief, man. Get a grip. As a fellow voice actor myself, I really appreciated the choice that Jonathan made there because for me if I was reading that I would take certain cues from it like Walmart and I think parking lot and things like that and I would go all right it's um it's it's American and I would do I would just whip out the old American accent not a euphemism but by Jonathan using his native Scottish accent it kind of like it adds another level of personality it adds another layer it adds a layer to the character. It's all of a sudden you've got a Scottish guy, to me, living in America. That's my reading of this, or my listening, perhaps I should say, of this audio adaptation, which is another wrinkle to the character. And you don't get that uh, out, you know, if you just read the written word. So I think it's a prime example there of why audio adaptations are a very valid thing and should be enjoyed by more people now we're going to finish off with uh, a special treat that i was very delighted to be able to uh, get hold of for you from my uh, good fellow i don't know if i'm supposed to say his name so i won't better err on the side of safety here but my good fellow at uh, nuclear blast records i'm a big fan of seller darling uh, they are anna murphy who is the vocals multi-instrumentalist in general but crucially plays the hurdy-gurdy and it was an, an enchanting sight uh in the small tent very first act at download to see uh Sella darling with anna murphy at the front spinning her witchy vocals turning the handle away and playing a hurdy-gurdy 
with some pretty crunchy guitars and drums behind her. Those guitars, the bass and guitars themselves are courtesy of Ivo Henzi, and Merlin Sutter provides the drums. They get all the best names, foreigners, don't they? Merlin Sutter. Sella Darling's second full-length album, of which the song is from, The Spell weaves a dark fairy tale for the modern era, told through heavy yet intricate progressive folk rock, enchanting visual art and utterly immersive storytelling. The band began in 2016 after Anna Murphy and Merlin Sutter and Ivo Henzi left Swiss folk metalers Illuvitae, and they are very good, by the way. They're their label mates, and their new album came out recently, and that album is fantastic. It's got some great Scottish voiceover in it as well. Not me, literally someone with a Scottish accent. I really recommend you check out Illuvitae's new album. But anyway, uh, all of uh, all of Cellar Darling played in Illuvitae for over a decade, but they weren't ready to end their musical journey together yet and embarked on a new and different path. Anna originally used the name Cellar Darling for her own solo album in 2013, but it also perfectly encapsulated their vision for this new adventure. Anna says that their music stems from ideas that were kept hidden away in a type of creative cellar, and are now ready to see the light. It also visualises their music, the darkness in the cellar, and Darling representing something light and beautiful. The three-piece introduced these spellbinding sounds to the world with their debut album, This Is The Sound, in 2017. But for the spell, they've decided to take their musical ideas and creativity one step further, and to make one of my favourite things to listen to, a concept album. After the initial idea for the spell, came to Anna randomly while she was out hiking with her father. It tells the tale of an unnamed girl who is birthed into a world that is full of pain, damaged and debilitated by the human beings that inhabit it. We follow her as she searches for meaning in life, when suddenly she meets and falls in love with death. Concluding with an ambiguous ending that leaves the listener wondering. That uh, coincidentally sounds a lot like Thanos's motivation from the comics, not the, not the movies, uh, the Marvel supervillain who falls in love with death and in order to impress her, sets out to exterminate most life in the universe. You never know, maybe we'll get some kind of crossover in a sequel. Though Anna set out to create abstract rather than autobiographical lyrics, the spell soon became a personal journey for her. She says, even if you write completely abstract lyrics, it is based on your life and personality somehow. She says it was strange because even though it was a dark concept when I created it, I was feeling happy. But then, as we were working on the album, my mental health got really bad, worse than ever before. It was as if the creative part of my brain was realising what state I was in before I became fully conscious of it. But focusing on the album helped Anna to work through these demons. She said, the music is always my outlet, and without it, I probably wouldn't be here anymore. I know what you mean. As someone with my own mental health issues, Anna, I know what you mean. But the ambition of the spell doesn't stop with music and lyrics. Stella Darling have created an audiobook that's narrated by Anna to complement the album's story. And they enlisted Romanian graphic designer Corstin Cierno, who's worked with Opeth, Ulva, and Wardrunner, and more to create vivid illustrations and animated videos for every track. For Cellar Darling, the intricate artwork is central to this album, and Merlin, the drummer, says, Even now when I'm listening to an album, I like to be able to look through the artwork, to hold the sleeve in your hand while you listen. It's very much a part of the album experience, in my opinion. I grew up with my dad's record collection, and we had something like 10,000 vinyl. It was a more deliberate way of listening to music. I like that phrasing, a deliberate way of listening to music. It's amazing that now we have something like this, that you can actually spend some time looking at while listening to the music. So I think it's amazing that we are able to make the artwork available digitally as well, in the form of animated videos for each and every track, and on our website as well. Anna concludes it gives more importance to the concept. Having something like a bonus track would have been great, but it wouldn't have completed what we started. With the audiobook and the fitting artwork, it closes the circle.
If you'd like to experience the album and the audiobook for yourself, the audiobook edition is available as the limited two CD digibook with signed insert double CD album version of The Spell. You'll get a signed picture along with that featuring a bearded man, a bald man, and a woman in a hat. You can buy that by simply visiting sellerdarling.com and you'll be confronted with a big splash page saying buy the new album here or something to that effect. To narrate and play us out from the audiobook and album of the same name, this is chapter four, The Spell, and then song four, The Spell. Until next time, travellers, I'll see you in the sound wave. Death, observing the love declarations of this ill-fated girl with sardonic amusement, was intrigued. How had Earth manifested such a pitiful soul? And which game might he play with her to brighten his dull days? And so Death cast a spell. No ordinary magic, but something special and rare, crafted especially for this moment, a spell of eternal life. The girl should forever remain in the hands of her tormentors and never see him again. And she should be oblivious to what had befallen her. Eternal life shall haunt her, he thought, just like his eternal duty was haunting him.
Sonic Space was hosted, written and produced by director Overtect Verbistect Loquinist Voxtect RJ Bailey and produced by Overtect Noel Chidwick. Music by Tunetect Alex Stora. Stories curated by Verbis Curate Voxtects Debbie Cannon and Jonathan Whiteside. Apocalypse Beta Test Survey. Written by Greg Chamberlain. Narrated by Voxtect Ben Blow. Death Do Us Part. Written by Tyler Petty. Narrated by Voxtect Sue Guyford. Targets. Written by Eric Brown. Narrated by Jonathan Whiteside. All stories produced by R.J. Bailey. Sonic Space, produced and presented by R.J. Bailey. Sam Dolan's book, From the Other Side, Anthology, is available on Amazon. The Spell, audiobook, and The Spell, song, by Sella Darling, from The Spell, limited 2-CD digibook, courtesy of Nuclear Blast. Artwork by Illutect, Mark Toner. 66.6% of the psychic energy generated by this podcast will be donated to the survivors of the 236th Grey Ghast Cyclin Interceptor War Fund.